So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for who you are, that you are good and holy and kind and wonderful. That, Lord, we can rely on you. We can. We can love you and honor you. And, Lord, that you take care of us. If we had a dictator over us, if we had lost all right, you would still be God and you would still call us to preach your word. And, and so, Lord, I pray that we rely on you for all that we need and that we will hold on to you for all that we need. And uh, I just pray for your, your blessings. I pray for your spirit to be upon us and that we would be faithful to you and that we would turn away from the things that want to control us and distract us and just pour our life into you, Lord. Thank you that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in the depths of God's holiness is the beauty of his grace and mercy. God is holy and God is merciful. God is present. And you know, that beautiful phrase, God is present, what does that mean? It means that God is with us and he's among us. He sent his son and his son walked among us. He dwelt among us. He had hands and feet. He touched people and he healed them. With his mouth, he commanded illness to die. With his feet, he walked. No, he stumbled to the cross because of the beatings that he took. But he went to the cross. With his eyes, he saw the dying and the hurting. With his voice, he spoke the words of God, his words. He spoke life and he gave life. He exposed sin, but he offered forgiveness. He's the final word of what God has said, and he is the complete word of God and the complete thing, everything that God wants to say. He is the sufficient word. He is the clear word. He is the necessary word, and he is the true word. The amazing truth that God is among us is seen in how immense and eternal he is. We can barely grasp the enormity of who God is and that he does not run out. I kind of want to give you a picture of how amazing and enormous and and wonderful and and awesome God is. Now, according to the data on the universe, it's estimated that the size of the universe is 92 billion light years in diameter. 92 billion light years in diameter. That means if to go from one end to the other, it would take you 92 billion light years. That is based on observable, uh, observable data. It could very well be bigger. So if you could stand on the edge of the universe and peer into the universe, you would see quasars, galaxies, nebula, stars, and suns. In the universe, it's estimated there are 100 billion galaxies. Not planets, galaxies in the universe. Our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is 100,000 light years in diameter. It's one of the smaller galaxies. Some are 1.5 million light years across. Now, for the past 100 years or less, uh, we've been sending radio signals out into space. And one group who's particularly interested in that is known as SETI. Search for extraterrestrial intelligence or something like that. Now, according to one website, for the past 100 years, the radio signals have traveled a distance of 200 light years. That's just 200 light years. So by that calculation, it would probably take approximately 500 years to reach the edge of just our galaxy. That's just one galaxy and the possibility of 100 billion in a universe that expands to 92 billion light years in diameter. That means if you could live 10,000 earth years and you could travel the speed of light, even though Einstein says you can't, that would mean you would not even reach the edge of our galaxy in your own lifetime. It would take 10, 10,000 year lifetimes to reach the edge of our galaxy. If I were to stand at the edge of the universe and regardless of the amount of time that I had, how much time would pass before me before I would be able to examine every galaxy, every planet, every canyon, every, every area of every planet, of every galaxy, of a hundred billion galaxies, how much time would pass, would be passed? How long would that take? And when you think of that, when you think of the vastness of just this galaxy and then the vastness of this universe, you see God holding the universe in the palm of his hand. And as he's holding the universe, he sees you. He sees me. And he even walked among us. If it would take almost an eternity to search the universe and examine every created planet and galaxy, would we ever then reach the end of God? 
Would we ever fathom the enormity of God if it took almost an eternity to search the entire universe? (laughs) Would we ever come to a point and say, well, God has stopped. I have reached the end of God. The vast beauty of his presence is wrapped up in knowing that he never ends. I'm reminded of Psalm 33 where it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. In Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. In Psalm 8, we hear, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man? That you're mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him. Why would you even look at me, an insignificant person on this tiny dot in this vast universe, and that you would care for me? He would care for you. And yet as big as this world is, as as big as this galaxy and universe, he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows your your most secrets of thought, your most innermost thoughts. And then get this, he invites you to know him. That is a subject you will never exhaust and never end. And this God who created the universe, this 92 billion light year in diameter universe, walked among us. So I challenge you today, seek God's presence. Seek his presence. Seek his presence because he's seeking you. He desires you. He loves you. He's mindful of you. And you know what? He's reaching for you. In the vastness of how huge this universe is, he sees you. In Matthew 9, will be in verses uh, 18, sermon verse 18. Jesus is in Capernaum. Um, there's nothing in the text to suggest that he is not in Capernaum. And so this is, and so as he's in the streets of the city, a man called a ruler comes up to him and asks for help. He seeks Jesus because Jesus is our greatest need and our greatest help. This man, Jesus, walked in the streets of Capernaum in the midst of the Roman Empire in a primitive and ancient time, speaks, acts, touches, and heals. Here's the creator of the universe, not just the galaxies or the solar system, but the universe responding to a man asking for help. Jesus, will you help me? Jesus, I need you. This man sought the presence of God. So I challenge you, seek God's presence. Number one, call on Jesus. Let's look at verse 18 and 19 of Matthew 9. While he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up, went with him, and so did his disciples. You know, that that kind of strikes me as funny, you know. Hey, Jesus, can you go heal this person? Let's go. <laughs> or this person has died. Go heal, make her live. Okay, let's go. I mean, who... <laughs> No, I, nothing I can do. <laughs> he just gets up and goes. Well, Shauna Palat had had enough. It was a Sunday morning in January of 2000, and her husband, Rick, still wasn't home from his Saturday night partying. It, and, and she says, I was at home with my son, Drake, who was three at the time, and it was a very common for her husband, Rick, to be out all night. I always knew that there was unfaithfulness. That bothered me naturally, but I was worried about Rick's safety, that he was going to turn up someplace dead. And that morning, I was at the end of my rope. That's what she says. As Shauna angrily washed the dishes in the kitchen, she noticed a man speaking on the television. She was quickly drawn to his message. He was funny and warm and seemed to be speaking at her level. I felt something came over me that I can't explain, she remembers. I couldn't quit crying. And at the end of the program, it said, join us. And it gave the name of the church. Well, she couldn't get her son dressed fast enough and got in the car and headed to church. She went to church with one thing on her mind, to get emotionally strong enough to kick that guy out. (laughs) Now she thought she had found the answer, but God had surprised for her. At the end of the message, the pastor invited people to 
come forward and give their lives to Christ. And immediately she, she didn't turn back from that. She went forward, she received Christ, and she never looked back. And three weeks later, her husband asked if he could join her at church. Well, Rick knew that his behavior was hurting the family, but he was held captive to drugs, sexual addictions. And after four or five weeks of attending church with his wife, he recognized his need for Christ. Still following, months weren't easy. He was going to church. He wanted to do right, but he was still struggling. He kept doing wrong. It wasn't until he went to this seminar called Promise Keepers. Remember that Promise Keepers seminar? He finally came to understand the importance of repentance and accepting that forgiveness. And that day he went home to his wife and he says, I'm, I can now be the husband that you need me to be. Rick and Shauna's lives took a 180 degree turn. Jesus changed their lives. Jesus heard their desperation. God knows your desperation. He's aware of it. So seek his presence. First observation, understand your need. Understand your need. As we begin this passage in Matthew 9, prior to this event, Jesus is talking to his disciples there in 14 through 17. He's talking to the disciples of John in particular, explaining the motivation and the heart when it comes to fasting and living in relationship with God. He was talking about how we are called to move in the Spirit and be prepared to live on call in the Spirit. So we have to understand, remember, number one, understand your need. You know, if you're on call at work, that means you, your work can call you and you have to report, right? Maybe you don't like to be on call. Oh, I hope that phone doesn't ring. But the Holy Spirit is in your life. You're on call. And he'll prompt you. He'll tell you. He'll move you. And sometimes you'll say, I don't want to do that. The Holy Spirit is in your life. You're on call. And so the same is true with living in the Spirit. We have to be on call for the Spirit because he'll call you. He'll prompt you. He'll move you. And we must be listening. Well, as he's explaining this, as he's talking about the wine and the wineskin and all this, about being moving in the Spirit, this ruler came and knelt before Jesus, it says. While he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. A few things we have to understand about what Matthew, how Matthew writes and how we read Matthew. First, Matthew may be one of the largest Gospels. Matthew is actually shorter than Luke. Do you know that? It has less words than Luke. <laughs> Matthew, though, shortens the events of Jesus, these Jesus events. Okay, they shorten these events. He leaves out key details. You could say he's the Reader's Digest version of the Gospels. Okay. In the event where the paralytic was healed, for example, it didn't mention a house, didn't mention the crowd, didn't mention the four guys having to cut a hole in the roof or any of that. It just shows that he healed him. In this event, in this event particularly in Matthew 9, 18, um, we see that there's no details that the, the girl died later, that uh, the lady turns around or Jesus turns around and uh, says, who touched me? He doesn't have all those details about that as you read in Mark and Luke. He doesn't even tell us the name of the guy that asked Jesus to tell his daughter. And we don't even tell that how old she is. Luke tells us this guy's name is Jarius, according to uh, uh, Mark. And um, <clears throat> And also, it, t- it doesn't tell us what kind of a ruler he is. Well, according to Mark, he's the ruler of the synagogue. Matthew says the girl is dead and Jesus needs to go and heal her. Not that she's dying and then dies, and then Jesus goes and heals her. He just cuts to the chase and he goes right to the end. And according to Mark and Luke, this man is, uh, you know, he is Jairus. He's the ruler of the synagogue. And when he approaches Jesus... Jerry asked that he go heal his daughter. Jesus, Matthew's kind of like the bottom line guy, okay? He's sort of like cuts to the chase. Okay, let's just move all these details. She's dead. You need to go heal her. It's kind of like how Matthew writes, okay? He just shortens the story and says, this is the bottom line. Go do it. <laughs> but in all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all, Jerry is kneels. The man kneels. In Matthew 8, as Jesus is coming down the mountain after his three-chapter sermon, a leper comes to him and kneels. Kneeling before Christ is a reminder of our need, our condition, and our status. Our kneeling says to Christ, I have nowhere else to go. He was desperate. How desperate are we? What will we do to get to him and kneel before him? He comes to Jesus and asks, please come and put your hands on her, and I know she will live. I'm desperate for you. 
Do you realize, though, what kind of prayer this is? This is an amazing prayer. Who would you ask of this? Who would you go to and say, make her live? Who in anyone's right mind would you go to and say, make my child live if that child is dead? It's an outrageous question. It's a ridiculous question because who would you go to and ask that question? If a person is dead, they're dead. And they go to this person and say, will you make this child live? Reminds me of Naaman in 2 Kings when he's told by the slave girl that the prophet in Samaria will heal him of his leprosy. This was just leprosy. And, and so it says, with, and, and then the king of Aram sent a letter, said, with this letter, I'm sending you my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. And the king of, Ar- of, of Israel, <laughs> this is what he says in St. Kings 5. He says, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? Is how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? It's unreasonable and irrational to ask me that. <laughs> I can't help you. It's unreasonable and irrational to anyone except Christ. Only Jesus gives life. There is no one else who gives life. He is life. He is the very reality of life. He's the author of life. And so we run to him. We run to Christ. This is why he promised in John 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Only he can offer that. There is no other person, no mantra that you can chant and no formula you can recite. Christ is life. That's why we seek him. The greatest need, though, we have is to be made right in God's eyes so we can know him. Our need is him. Our destruction is God if we don't if we run from him because our sins will destroy us. We are dead in our sin. We need a transformed heart. We need a new life. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this man, Jairus, came to Jesus and asked for the impossible, literally, the ridiculous and the outrageous. He sought the presence of God. I tell you, seek the presence of God. Number, uh, point number two, wait on Christ. Let's look at verse 20 and 22. Just then, so Jesus is on his way. He gets up and goes with the Jairus. Verse 20, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. So as Jairus asked Jesus to come to his house and make his daughter live, Jesus gets up and goes along with his disciples. Just, yeah, I'll go do that. He did the same thing in Matthew 8 when the centurion asked if he could heal his servant. Jesus is on his way when the centurion stops and says, Ah, you don't need to come to the house, just say the word. Well, as Jesus this time, he gets stopped again. Now, according to Mark and Luke, a large crowd is following, and many, and, and in many ways they're impeding Christ from getting to where he needs to get there quickly. And as he's walking and trying to manage the crowd, a woman seeks Christ. She is desperate as well. She's in need of a healing touch. And poor Jairus is probably becoming anxious. Number one, reach for Christ. Reach for Christ. You know, as Jesus is walking to this man's house, a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years reaches out and touches the edge of Christ's cloak. It reminds me of Matthew 14, when Jesus went to the land called Gennesaret, a similar region where he healed the demoniac. And it says this, people brought to Jesus all who were sick and And then we read, all who touched him were healed. They just reached out his hand and and they touched the edge of his cloak. And they were healed. They reached for Christ. Reaching for Christ is your salvation. What other person can you reach toward to find your hope and your salvation? So this woman is bleeding, which would make uh, make her unclean. She'd be continually unclean religiously and in her culture. She was unclean. She was not allowed in any religious ceremony. She was kicked out because of her condition if she was unclean that means that anyone that she touched she would make unclean according to the law she was not even to be in the crowd but she was desperate according to the talmud this is a jewish book 
there were at least 11 different cures for her condition, some medical and others were pure superstition. And according to Mark, we read in Mark 5, she suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. I imagine she tried those 11 cures that were in the Talmud. I imagine she tried every one. I imagine she poured all her money into everything she could. She went to doctor after doctor and she got no relief. I imagine it was painful. She was desperate and thought, if I just touched the edge of his cloak, she would be healed. Who else could she go to? Who else she could, should she, could she run to? What other name are you going to use besides the name of Jesus Christ? She reached for Christ because she sought and needed the presence of God. Now, she reached out to him in a quiet manner, not wanting to draw attention because, for one thing, she's not supposed to be in the crowd. And, and secondly, she's, she's going to make him unclean. She didn't want attention to herself. So she said, I'll just do this quietly. She thought, I will make Jesus unclean by touching him. But I'm here to tell you, there is no sinner that can make Jesus unclean. He makes the sinner clean. You know, in Matthew 9, just before she touches the cloak or she's touching this cloak, Jesus turns and she's healed. In Mark, it says that she's successful, it's successful in touching his cloak. And then Jesus asks this ridiculous question. Who touched me? You know. And if you were one of the disciples, you would have thought, who touched you? Everyone touches you. We're in a crowd. Who hasn't touched you? I mean, this crowd was moving. It was huge. There were hundreds of people around me. What do you mean who touched you? Well, someone touched me. <laughs> you know, this always reminds me, this event, of a story in my life. When, when I was growing up, I was a teenager in Price, Price, Utah. And I, my good friend Steve and I, uh, we hung out all the time. And when we were a little older, you know, driving age, we wanted to go to Lagoon one day. You know what Lagoon is, right? And then Raging Waters. I don't know if they exist anymore, Raging Waters. It was this water park. But. And so we, he had a grandfather, and, and his grandparents lived in Salt Lake, so we'd stay there. So the one day we went to Lagoon, we hung out, then we went to the, his grandparents' house and stayed the night. And the next morning I realized, oh, I forgot my comb. I got to look good. You know, I can't, I can't go out with messy hair. You know, so we're in the bathroom and I open this drawer and go, oh, there's all these combs everywhere, like 30 or 40 black combs, all different shapes and sizes. She'll never know. You know, and so we go to Raging Waters, we come back. And when we come back, <clears throat> the grandmother asks, how was your day? Oh, and by the way, who took my comb? <laughs> who took your comb? How would you know? It kind of reminds me of that. Who touched me? Well, how would you? What? Number two, forgiven by Christ. Forgiven by Christ. The woman reached out and touched his cloak. She was healed. Jesus turns to her. In many ways in that culture, it would have been appropriate to have cursed her. It would have been appropriate probably to condemn her. Because this woman was already unclean. She was in the crowd. She touched a rabbi. And when Jesus turned around and saw this woman, this woman was afraid. I imagine she would be. She was, in her mind, she had done something wrong, in her mind, culturally and religiously wrong. But Jesus didn't condemn her. He didn't accuse her. He didn't yell at her. He didn't hate her. He didn't curse her, but he simply accepted her. He says, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. You're no longer unclean. I think he had to do that publicly so everyone around here would know. Everyone would hear. She's no longer unclean. She is set free. She sought the presence of God. So seek God's presence. She was forgiven. She was healed. She was cleaned. She, was, she no longer suffered. She reached out in desperation and she was saved. Jesus saved her because he is the presence of God. I ask you, who are you reaching for today? What are you straining to gain? I tell you, reach for Christ. Reach for his forgiveness. Receive the life he gives. In the meantime, could you imagine Jairus? What would he be thinking? Hurry up, Jesus. My daughter needs you. Forget that woman. Let's go. But there are times we're called to wait on him. To wait on God. 
We are to rest in him. Now, the scriptures don't ever tell us what Jairus is going through. Maybe he was sitting there patiently waiting. Maybe he was straining inside with worry. I don't know. But we are called to wait on God. In Psalm 46.10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. In Psalm 40, verse 1, it says, I waited for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. As Jerry has called on Christ, he had to wait for him. As the woman who suffered in her unclean state, she had to wait 12 years for Christ. 12 years. In our seeking his presence, he calls us to wait on him. Seek God's presence. Number three, rejoice in him. Rejoice in Christ. Let's look at verse 23. When Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. News of this spread through all that region. Rejoice in Christ. Rejoice in him. You know, only 12 years old and in the moment, one Ethiopian girl's world turned into a nightmare. Seven violent men abducted the preteen, intending to force her into marriage. The men held the girl for seven days, beating her repeatedly. Such, common, such incidents were common in Ethiopia. As several men band together to abduct young girls for the purpose of securing a bride. The girls are typically beaten into submission and oftentimes raped. In this particular instance, there was not a human being with an earshot to hear this, the cries of this girl. But her cries were heard. The unlikely heroes were three majestic Ethiopian lions. Famous for their large black manes, these lions are the national symbol of the country. In response to the girl's cry for help, three lions leapt from the brush and chased her captors away. Perhaps the child thought she had traded one danger for another. (laughs) But remarkably, her heroes formed a protective perimeter around her. A half day later, when the police arrived, the guardian lion simply stood up and walked away. And and the sergeant said, they stood guard until we found her, and then they just left her like a gift and went back into the forest. Among the explanation for the lion's unusual behavior, one wildlife expert suggested the girl's whimpering could have sounded like a lion cub. For whatever reason, the predator served as a protector. The carnivore became a sentinel. Everyone thinks this is some kind of miracle. It is. It is a miracle. This 12-year-old girl was helpless, powerless to change her situation. Her deliverance had to come from a power greater than herself and outside of herself. God at times puts us in a situation where we have no options and no choices. We have no voice and no power to overcome whatever situation we're in. He puts us puts his people in slavery by a powerful empire called Egypt. There's no way to escape, no way to change their identity. So God acted. When, you were in, when they were in the desert, they had no food and no water. So God acted. When they were wandering and lost, God gave them his word and his law. God acted. When he sees you and me unable to change our status of sin or dead in sin, dying in sin, lost in sin, he acted. He sent Christ. He gave you Christ. So seek his presence. Number one, Christ is not done. Christ is not done. As Christ moved on from the woman who was healed, he goes to Jairus' house. And by now the young girl is dead. And from the evidence we see that the young girl was dying when Jairus left to get Jesus and died while on the way to get to him. We find out that the girl was 12 years old, according to Luke. We find that when Jesus is healing the woman, a man came to Jairus and told him, your daughter's dead. There's nothing that can be done. It's over. All your options are done and gone, except the reality. It is interesting to mark that the woman touched him and was healed. It said that he felt power coming out of him when he healed that woman. And you wonder, well, then will he have enough power to heal this girl? No, the power of Christ is not gone because it can't be gone. Christ is not done. As Jesus approaches Jairus' house, he saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, as it says here. Now, what you're seeing is the funeral is beginning. The mourning period is starting. 
And since Jairus was a synagogue ruler, that means he occupied a prominent position in, in, in the community. A synagogue ruler was someone like a layman given a prominent position or title. And so he was a prominent man. And so he had a, large, a lot of people around him that knew him and they, they cared for him. So this man was important in his community. Well, the funeral of the ancient world consisted of professional mourners and wailers. Could you imagine that? If you prayed real well, I mean, cried real well and was really dramatic, you could be hired as a professional mourner. And so you get these people, and as, you're, as the funeral is about to begin or the mourning period, you have these people. And this is why he's saying, um, when he entered the house, he saw the flute players and the noisy crowd. That was it. There was a professional mourners, like, ah, you know, praying and screaming out. And that's why they laughed so quickly, because they weren't really serious, you know. It really wasn't heartfelt. It wasn't deep within. They weren't really deeply, genuinely sad. That's their job. Well, when there was a funeral, music was played, mourning would take place, and the idea was for the family not to mourn alone, or there would be a lot of people to mourn with you. As Jesus assesses the situation, he notices he sees all this commotion, but to him it's a phony commotion. It's phoniness. So he tells them, go away, because she's not dead. And they immediately laugh. That is the phoniness of what they're doing. They don't believe him. How ridiculous. She's dead. It's confirmed. Now let us do our job. But Christ is not done. He dismisses the crowd. He removes the phoniness and superficial. And when you seek the presence of God, and let me warn you, the superficial has to go. Seek his presence. Number two, no acknowledgement. It's interesting, Jesus does not even acknowledge death. She's not dead, she's asleep. He is life. He won't even acknowledge what, has, what death has done. He denies its power. It has no power over him. He sees the girl, he takes her by the hand. A simple touch of Christ defeats death. The dramatic end of this event is four words. And she got up. <laughs> and she got up. Death has no answer. It has no power in the presence of Christ. He took her hand and she got up. She was not injured. She was not sick. She was dead. And she got up. He touched her hand and she got up. It's the hand of Christ that we need. It is his presence we desire. It is his presence where life is found. True life, real life, abundant life, and never ending life. In both events, we see that the woman and the ruler were in a situation where they had no options but Jesus. Jesus was their only option. Is that our situation? That is our, let me say that, this is our situation now. When you strip away the illusion that we got it all together, that everything's okay, when you strip all that away, Jesus is our only option. We can put all this stuff in our life and say, yeah, I'm, I'm good. He stripped that all away. Jesus is our only option. He's our greatest option. He's our best option. He is our only option. So I challenge you, seek the presence of God. Let's pray. God, you are amazing. You are holy and good. And you give us life. You reach out to us all the time saying, come to me. And Lord, I pray that if there are people here who don't know you, they would see the hand, your hand, reaching out to them and say, come to me. I want to give them, I want to give you life. I want to give you hope. I want to give you salvation. I want to give you love. So Lord, I pray that we will be a people who will shine the light of Jesus. We would be the hands of Christ. We would be the words of Christ. So Lord, you would help us to break the strongholds of the enemy because of Christ. So thank you for your word, Lord.